Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. The RTM TV Online Bible Study with Jacob Prash with Elijah Part 3. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome along to RTN TV. My name is Amos. This is the online Bible study every Wednesday here from 7 o'clock until 9 across the world on RTN TV, live stream as well on RTN TV and on Moriel TV on YouTube. And we also have a studio, an online studio audience here on Zoom. We have had a few issues. Our audience is about a third of what we normally have, but we will get some more throughout the evening. We had a technical issue with emails, so I do apologize in advance. I know many of you have emailed me today and yesterday getting a little bit anxious I hadn't received the normal RTN TV email. Charles had tested the system and checked it, and it was working, but there is still an issue, and we don't know what that issue is. We've checked with some of the guys and girls tonight online, and it's it's not consistent. Some people in, in States... With some hosts, Yahoo, are getting it. Other people on Yahoo and other parts of the world aren't. Some people in Google are. Some people in Google aren't. So we don't know what the issue is. But rest assured, we will get to the bottom of it and resolve the issue. So if you haven't received your Zoom invitation tonight and you're watching on the live stream from RTN or from Morial TV, thank you very much. Hopefully, we will get this resolved next week. Any updates, of course, I will post them on the online Bible study Facebook group. And just on that, I'd just like to mention we have a wonderful sister called Susanna who, who's moderating the uh, the site for us and she's dealing with a lot of your queries and a lot of your issues. She also does the same thing for, for Be Alert, for any of you who look at the, the Moriel Be Alert page, which is a very, very busy page. So she's a busy lady, so she doesn't get back to you sometimes as quickly as you'd, you'd expect. She does have a day job and she's doing this under the kindness of her heart. So thank you very much to Susanna if you're watching at home tonight. But um just want to welcome Suzanne on board. She does work very hard in keeping both those ministries going, and she's doing a great job. So thank you, Susanna. Um, Jacob <clears> is <throat> teaching tonight on part three of Elijah. Tonight, it's Elijah Makes It Rain from Kings 1 Kings uh, 18. Um, Jacob, I'm guessing this will be the final concluding part tonight. Would that be correct? Well, perhaps not. Let's continue. <laughs> okay. Okay. What we'll do, we'll ask um, Charles. Actually, would you open in prayer for us tonight, Charles? Bless you. Oh, he's gone. He's gone off air. Okay, not a problem. No, Colin, I'm here. Colin, I'm here. Hello, Colin. Hi, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I was just going to ask you if you'd open a prayer for us, brother. Okay. Father God, we thank you for this time together where we can meet online and share along with this wonderful Bible teaching. Father, we pray for Jacob this evening. We pray that you'll give him the power of the Holy Spirit to disseminate the word to us tonight that we'll all have ears to hear and the holy spirit can speak mm. to us we ask these things in the name of our lord jesus amen amen thank you charles jacob over to you brother as usual during this part of the program during the presentation we'll mute all the microphones if you can make sure that stays that way and then whenever jacob finishes the lesson if you wish to ask any questions just simply unmute your microphone or send me through a message and I will moderate the program from there on. And thank you very much for joining us. This is the RTN Online Bible Study with Jacob, looking at Elijah. Blessings of Jesus, dear friends. Tonight's Bible study, of course, will be based on what has preceded it last week and the week prior to that. If you're not with us, it's not going to make as much sense <clears throat> unless you, of course, watched it as it was posted on RTN, if, unless you watched the video. Um, be that as it may, before we go to First Kings... Turn with me once again to a passage we looked at last week in Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Verse 11, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or for water, but rather for the hearing of the word of God. Remember, there'd been no prophet for 400 years before John the Baptist came in the spirit and character of Elijah. He fed the people at the end of a long famine to prepare for the first coming of Christ. The same thing happens with the return of Christ. The people are fed 
somehow by the ministry of Elijah after a famine for the hearing of the word of God to prepare for the second coming of Christ. What did happen is a shadow of what is going to happen again. A famine for the hearing of the word of God. Why do we have people staying up right this very moment at, at crazy hours in places in, in the world like Australia and things like this where it, it, it's, it's an awkward hour? Well, because there's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. People are not being taught the word of God in churches. However, there will be grain for the famine. There will always be grain for the famine as we've been looking at. Now, this is going to increase before Jesus comes. Famines for the hearing of the word of God will increase. Remember, we have no chapter divisions in the original Hebrew or Greek canon. As we continue reading into the next chapter 3, Amos writes about, Though they hide on the summit of Mount Carmel, I will search them there and take them from there, though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea. From there I will command the serpent, and it will bite them. This idea of the serpent biting, remember the serpent beguiled the woman. The serpent is always Satan in his mode as deceiver, as opposed, of course, to the dragon, which is Satan, the persecutor, the deceiver. Spiritual deception is associated with Mount Carmel and with the sea. Now, with this in view, let's go to 1 Corinthians, where we left off. I'm sorry, 1 Kings, where we left off, chapter 18. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was critical in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah, which means like the servant of Yahweh, feared the Lord greatly. For when Jezebel destroyed the <clears throat> prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water <clears throat> and to all of the valleys. Perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and the mules alive. The situation is, of course, becoming increasingly desperate. It then continues. And not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them <clears throat> to survey it. Ahab went one way <clears throat> by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him and recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? And he said to him, It is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? And the Lord, as the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where any master has not sent to search for you. And <clears throat> when they said, he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now you are saying, go to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about when I leave you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. <clears throat> so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I had a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave, and provided them with bread and water. And now you're saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will then kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him <clears throat> today. 
So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I've not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now, then send and gather me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Let's understand certain things, first of all, concerning the time he was prophesying. Samaria then referred only to a geographical location whose capital was Sebast. Sebast. It was not referring to the Samaritans who would be essentially Assyrians who intermarried with the remaining Jewish population and became the Samaritans, as in the woman at the well or the Samaritans of, of John chapter 8. They came much later. These people were Hebrews. They were not Samaritan mixed bloods or anything of that nature. So let's understand some other things. When Jesus was going to feed the people, he said, have the people sit down. And how big were the groups in which he fed them? 50. So what do you see here? Elijah is feeding the people in groups of 50. In a famine, when there's a food shortage, don't look for big churches, don't look for conferences, don't look for mega churches. That's over. That's not going to happen. The Lord is going to feed people in smaller groups. Don't look for a church or a congregation or a fellowship with more than 50 people. If they are that, they've sold out to Jezebel. The bigger ones will sell out to Jezebel. That's why they'll be given a license to continue. The faithful ones will be hiding in caves. They'll be an underground church. They'll be fed in small groups. Okay? We have to understand what it meant for Elijah's time, what it meant for the first coming of Jesus with the 50s, and what it means for us today and for the days that are coming prophetically and eschatologically. Let's look a bit further at this. The prophets who were false were not only of Baal, but they were of Asherah. Asherah, the female cult deity, the female cult deity. It doesn't matter what you call her. From the Council of Ephesus in the 5th century, they began identifying the pagan queen of heaven with Mary, the mother of Christ. It is not Mary, the mother of Christ. The Madonna portrayed by the Roman Catholic Church is not the medium of Scripture. It is the female cult deities of the ancient Near East, Diana, Minerva, uh, Artemis. And here, of course, it is uh, Asherah. You will find a statue on the summit of Carmel today, on front of the Carmelite monastery. On top of this pole, there's a statue of the Madonna, of Mary. Now, I'll tell you a true story. We were having meetings in Israel at the foot of Mount Carmel. This is back in the early 1980s. And there was a charismatic Catholic, a born-again, he said, Catholic monk, who was a very nice person, a nice guy. His name was Gregory. And <clears throat> he'd come to our meetings with us in Haifa at the foot of Mount Carmel, and he'd be singing Hallelujah and he'd be singing Amazing Grace or whatever. And we had people there who spoke English, people who spoke Hebrew, speak, people who spoke Arabic. It was a multicultural meeting, but he would come to them, and people accepted him as a brother in Christ. He was born again. Nobody held the fact that he was a Carmelite against him because he would come in secular clothes. He wouldn't dress up in his cassock or his clerical outfit. Well, in Haifa, every year, 
they moved Mary from her summer home to her winter home. She doesn't like the cold weather too much. So they took her, the statue, and they have a procession every year down Mount Carmel carrying the statue. And they put the statue in the Latin church until the weather changes some months later, and then they bring it up in another procession. Now, when Jews and Muslims see this statue being carried and people bowing down to the statue, singing Ave Maria, and all this religious processions, and they're throwing flowers at it, and they're singing praises to Mary. When they see, when Jews and Arabs see people bowing down to a graven image of, of, of Mary, of who they claim is Mary, to them, they think this is Christianity. To say the least, it is a very destructive witness to Jews and to Muslims. Because to Orthodox Jews and to Muslims, it is an act of idolatry. The Hebrew word for to bow down is the same as the word to worship, hishtak vayah. Greek is the same, prasciutto. No matter what anybody tries to tell you, when people bow down before a graven image, when you see them lighting incense and candles and putting flowers before a graven image, that is idolatry. That is an act of idolatry. You can call it Mary, but it's Asherah. So they bring the statue in the procession down, and all the Jews and the Arabs are watching it, and they're seeing this idolatry and religious fanfare, <clears throat> which is Roman Catholicism, and they think this is Christianity. <clears throat> and it makes it very difficult for the believers, both among the Jews and among the Arabs, to go evangelize and preach the true gospel after people see this idolatry. Well, lo and behold, there he was. Brother Gregory, the born-again charismatic Catholic. Only now he wasn't wearing regular clothes. Now he was wearing his vestments. And he was with his fellow Carmelites, singing Ave Maria with the rest of them. How can you be born again? to trust Christ for your salvation and remain in a false religion that is steeped in idolatry and superstition that comes from the ancient Near East and from the pontifical religions of ancient Rome and pretend it's Christianity. How can you hold these two in tension? It's always been an issue. It becomes an issue in the early church where Jesus warned Thyatira he begins to warn at Pergamum, actually, but he says, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. The spirit of false religion personified by Queen Jezebel, the bride of Ahab. You tolerate her. Now this passage ends. Those who eat at Jezebel's table, in verse 19, those who eat at Jezebel's table. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation. The message to the seven churches. Jesus warns. The message to Thyatira, which in Greek means continual sacrifice. Catholicism teaches Jesus continues to die sacramentally. He doesn't die once and for all, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, or as it says repeatedly in the epistle to Hebrews. He dies again and again in the Mass. I know your deeds, says Jesus, your love and faith and service and perseverance. and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Now notice he says what's right about them before he says what's wrong. 
your love and your faith and service. Oh, I know wonderful Catholic believers. I know wonderful believers in the Roman Catholic Church. And they have love and they have faith and they, they believe what we get. Aren't they wonderful? And it even says, or Jesus tells them, that their later deeds are greater than at first. Oh, there are some Catholics doing things that Catholics didn't used to do. They're, they're, they're doing things differently now. They're becoming more scriptural. And people swallow this. And there may even be a measure of truth in it. In fact, there is a measure of truth in it. Jesus said so. But then he says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bond servants astray. She leads sincere Christians astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The transubstantiated Eucharist. Acts 15. The Holy Spirit shows the apostles no cannibalism. The ritual consumption of blood is vampire religion. Don't do it! The apostles say, don't do it. The Holy Spirit showed us, tell the Gentiles to stop doing this. Don't do this. No vampire religion, no ritual consumption of blood. Now the Jewish Passover, do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial from where we get the actual Lord's Supper. No ritual consumption of blood. But where you get transubstantiation, a doctor not defined until the Renaissance by Thomas Aquinas, in fact, under the guise of Aristotle's debunked philosophy of accidents, completely thrown out the window by what we know now about chemistry and physics. This is real blood. Well, if it's his real blood, why are you drinking it? It's an abomination. You see the woman with that cup, she's drunk on the blood of the saints. Be careful of those who think with their emotions or who even recognize there are sincere people who may be believers in the Roman church. Now, it's not just the Roman church. This co-equally applies to the Eastern Orthodox Church. But we don't have as much of that in most Western countries as you do in the Middle East, although there is a sizable Eastern Orthodox community in Britain and in <clears throat> Canada and the USA and Australia and so forth. It's played second fiddle to the Roman Church, obviously, numerically and statistically. But it's the same thing. It is also the same thing to the High Church of England, the High Anglicans. They believe the same idolatry. It is not only Rome. They believe the same idolatry. Idolatry and immorality go hand in hand. You will not find any practitioners of idolatry in the world that are not saturated in immorality. There's a reason that the Roman church that practices idolatry is also immersed in sexual perversion of the worst kind, pedophilia, on a grand scale, globally and always has been. This kind of molestation of children and sexual violation of children took place in these pagan religions of the ancient Near East, and they've continued under the pseudo-Christian guise of Roman Catholicism. 
Now, again, I'm not attacking Catholic people. My mother's family are Catholic. I'm not attacking Roman Catholic people. I love them. I love my family. But because I love them, I want them to know the truth. And more importantly, Jesus wants them to know the truth. You can't practice this. You cannot practice that religion without sinning against God. Every time they pray to the dead, it's the sin of necromancy. Every time they participate in the Eucharist, the Mass, it's the sin of idolatry. Every time they consume their Eucharist, it is the sin of cannibalism. You cannot practice the Roman Catholic religion without sinning. The idea that people should remain in that church that requires them to sin in order to practice it is an outrage and it is a shame and a disgrace that so many evangelical leaders and apologists won't say what people say that of Catholicism were willing to be martyred for. If you were to read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, all of those people, Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Cranmer, Tyndale, they were saved out of the Roman Church. They were Roman Catholic clergy, and they realized that the Mass was idolatry. It was the Eucharist primarily that they were burned alive, but they chose to be burned alive. They would not compromise with the things that Rabbi Zacharias did, or that Louis Palou does, or that so many other ones do. The televangelists will never say anything. A Roman Catholic's money to them is as good as any evangelicals or Protestants or whatever. They're in business. What are we saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm only looking at what the Word of God said. You beguile my servants to eat food, sacrifice to idols. This comes directly. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. Jesus takes this directly from the saga of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. The woman Jezebel and eating at Jezebel's table. You participate in the Roman Catholic Mass and Eucharist. You are eating at Jezebel's table. It is a sin. As I've often said, Nobody in their right, no Christian in their right mind would tell an alcoholic to keep hitting the jug and hanging out in pubs and bars and getting drunk so we can reach other alcoholics with the gospel. Nobody in their right mind would tell a prostitute to keep turning tricks on the streets in order in order to uh, evangelize other hookers. Nobody would tell something. That'd be crazy. It'd be insane. But it's happening. When you tell someone it is okay to remain in this religion, when Jesus says, come out of her, my people, be it the Eastern Orthodox Church, be it the High Anglican Church, be it the Roman Catholic Church, and remember, liberal Protestantism is even worse. He doesn't say they're not his people. He says, because you are my people, get out of it. Now, I've known a number of people who got saved while they were still in the Roman church, but they were truly saved. Through prayer and through reading the scripture and through fellowship, the Holy Spirit showed them, get out of it. Those who remain in, choose Jezebel over Christ. This is what's happening, and that's what did happen. We can't understand Revelation 2 unless we understand 1 Kings 18. What it meant for Elijah's day, what it meant for the first coming of Christ, what it means for us now and as we look forward to the second coming of Christ. Let's continue. Remember, all of Israel's prophets foreshadow, typify the Messiah in some way. 
We are told in Hebrews, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is a shadow of Christ. We are not reading things into the text asegetically. It doesn't say by looking at these types because we're told the whole thing is a shadow, a type of Jesus fulfilled in him. He fulfills the Torah. All of these prophets are pictures of Christ, and Jesus fed the people in groups of 50. Let's continue. The conflict comes. Now notice the conflict takes place, but there's a direct conflict between Elijah personally and Ahab personally. I wrote a book called, entitled Shadows of the Beast, where we looked, among other things, at many or most of the types of the Antichrist. I'm not saying all, but most of the major types of the Antichrist in Scripture. The same as there's types of Christ, there's types of the Antichrist. And that man who was wed to Jezebel, Ahab, is one of them. When we get to the book of Revelation, we see in chapter 11, there will be a conflict between the two witnesses and the Antichrist. There will be a conflict. When he comes, he's going to try to put them out of business. Now, again, we can talk about, is it Moses and Elijah? Is it Elijah and Elisha? And so forth. Some say Enoch. Some even say the Apostle John in the Middle East. Be that as it may, there seems to be a consensus that at least one of them is Elijah. Be it literally Elijah, or Elijah in the sense of John the Baptist that is in the character of. We've talked about these things in the previous two Bible studies. There will be a direct conflict between the harbinger of Christ and the Antichrist. A direct face-to-face -face conflict. Remember, Herod the Great was a, and Herod's sons, they were all types of Antichrist, and John the Baptist confronted them. The wicked woman, Herodias with Salome, tried to turn, or did turn, the king against John, who was in the character of Elijah. That simply replays what happened to Elijah with Ahab and Jezebel. Again, I refer you back to our previous two teachings. Obadiah is terrified. There are going to be people like Obadiah in these last days. They may be in positions within government or in the corporate world or the legal system who are going to be faithful to the Lord, but they're going to have to be very low-key and very careful because they're going against the policies of the government. Remember, holding to the doctrines of Scripture will be considered criminal, as it was with Jesus. He was not unjustly convicted of any crime. It was politically motivated. It was a politically motivated accusation of sedition of which Pilate admitted he was not even guilty. Nonetheless, that's what transpired. And that's what's going to transpire. Some of you listening, some of you watching today on live stream may be Obadiahs. Others will be in those groups of 50s who are being fed. What did happen is what is going to happen. And it appears to have already begun. Not that I'm speculating or date setting. But the template is becoming more and more defined, isn't it? Let's continue. There will be a conflict. Remember, the priests of Asherah and the priests of Baal were not Phoenicians. They were Hebrews, backslidden Hebrews. In the last days, 
Our first problem is not going to be the pagans. Our problem is not going to be Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Our first problem is going to be false brethren, the apostate church and their clergy, the priests of Baal. Let's look. Verse 20, please. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Har Karmel, Mount Carmel. I used to live on Mount Carmel. My wife's family apartment is on Mount Carmel. Our children are born on Mount Carmel. I know the neighborhood and the area quite well. To the west, you can see the Mediterranean. And to the east, down below, you can see the western orifice of the Valley of Jezreel, more popularly known as the Valley of Armageddon, with the Brook of Kishon, the Brook of Kishon, which would have been nearly all dried up, but not completely due to the uh, drought. So Ahab sent the message, and they all congregate. And he says in verse 21, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Remember, what's in the name, if you were with us two weeks ago? Yahweh was to be Israel's true Baal, meaning husband, master, owner. The Canaanites had a Baal by the same name. Again, much the same as Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Only their Jesus Christ is not the monogene, is not the only begotten son of the Father. The Mormon Jesus from the Book of Mormon is the spirit brother of Satan. You know, Islam, Mormonism, the Eucharistic Christ of Rome, they all say they have Jesus Christ, but it's a different Jesus. It's not the one of Scripture. Continues. But the people didn't answer him a word. Notice, in a climate like this, when people are confronted by irrefutable truth that challenges them, they try to stay on the fence. You confront them with irrefutable proof of what the actual truth is. But don't expect them to either deny it, nor act upon it. I'm speaking about people now who profess to be Christians. I'm not talking about those who make no Christian profession. I mean people who say they're Christians. Do not expect them to act upon it. Those who will act upon it have been acting upon it already, like Obadiah and the prophets he hid in groups of 50. But let's continue. They didn't answer a word. What comes about next? Then Elijah said to the people, I am alone, I'm left, a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Very, very similar odds to what Micaiah faced when he faced Ahab. Remember? When God put a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets, and only Micaiah knew it, it was one against 400 plus For every true prophet, for every true prophet today, there are literally hundreds of false ones. For every true prophet today, there are hundreds of false ones. And it will get worse. Now let them give us two oxen. Let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood. But put no fire under it. 
and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. Now, in the Hebrew text, this would be Yahweh. And the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the people said, that's a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Goes on for hours. O oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice. Reason God, either he's occupied or gone aside. In other words, making use of a lavatorial facility. He began mocking them mocking their beliefs. If you look at God's sense of humor, if you look at divine humor in Scripture, we see it most conspicuously in Psalms, but not only in Psalms. Does God have a sense of humor? Yes. It is usually displayed when he mocks his enemies. God has what people would interpret I'm not saying it's what it is, but it's a way that people would popularly interpret it as a sarcastic sense of humor. He mocks other gods. He knows their demon idols. He mocks those who worship and follow these other gods. They are worthy of mockery. They're worthy of mockery. I remember they had the Walsingham Witness in England, and they were carrying the statue of Mary in the Walsingham procession. And you had even evangelical bishops from the Church of England supposedly participating it with the Catholics carrying it. And there were a group of Christians, many of them ex-Catholics, giving out tracts. And as the thing went by, they began to sing stuff. They, they, oh, you beautiful doll, you great big beautiful doll. How can you mock like that? It's deserving of mockery. When you look at Islam, you just look at it. Look at what happens in countries with Sharia, Islamic law. You look at it. You can watch videos of them mutilating their own children in Lebanon. This went on in the ancient world. Now it goes on at the same location under the guise of Islam. You look in the Quran. I say to Muslims, well, let me see. Arabs didn't have alphanumerics. The Greeks, the Romans, the Hebrews, they all used letters as numbers. But Arabs, they were so clever, they invented digits, numerals that were digits instead of letters. Now, that's clever people. Our numbers are actually Arabic numbers that we write digitally. Well, the Quran tells us that Miriam, Mary, the sister of Moses, and Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, are the same woman. So I ask Arab Muslims, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Miriam, the sister of Moses, lived at least 1,300 years apart. Given the fact that your people invented numbers, don't you know how to count? Does that sound sarcastic? 
Yes! Now, I don't say we should try to get people angry and insult them when we're trying to witness to them. But if there's an open conflict, then they become assertive in what they are. What did Elijah do? Deserves to be mocked. Hinduism? They feed sacred cows on the streets in Mumbai. But if you got the money, you can go into a tourist hotel and buy a hamburger and eat the god. <laughs> it's just crazy. It's worthy of mockery. Hinduism is worthy of mockery. The caste system is an ugly, unjust system perpetuated by a racist religious belief system. The lower caste are the darker people, the higher caste, the Brahmins are the lighter skinned people. It's totally racist. My God says, I am the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods before me. Your God says, how can you mock like that? Ask Elijah. God mocks his enemies. He also mocks a lack of faith, like with Isaac, Itzhak, he shall laugh. But he primarily mocks his enemies. He derides them. You see these people today. They're so anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, pro-abortion, pro-same-sex marriage. And they hate Christianity. They hate the teachings of Jesus. They may say they believe in Christianity and they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the Jesus of Scripture. God mocks those people. He knows what's going to become of them. He mocks them. Now, he would certainly prefer they repented and believed. But as we see in Romans, he gives them over to it. Well, what comes about next? They didn't answer. There was no voice. So they leapt about and they went into a frenzy. When you remember what happened with that counterfeit revival from Toronto and its clone in Pensacola defended by Michael Brown, when you look at those antics of people on the floor imitating animals and in drunken hysterics and things like this, the same thing. Same thing. Always remember the fruit of the spirit is a crete, self-control. They get out of control. Idolatry will drive people out of control. So there's a lot. And he's standing there. There's no voice. It continues. Elijah said maybe he's asleep. He needs to be wakened up. Now, to the Hebrew mind, He who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. You see, our God, the God of the Judeo-Christian faith, we're a Magio Dei. We are theopomorphic men and women the gods of other nations, the false gods, are anthropomorphic gods. They make God in their image and likeness. Maybe your God is draining his bladder. Maybe your God is taking a nap. So it continues. It goes on, and it goes on. Verse 28, so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to the custom with swords and lances until the blood 
gushed out of them. I have seen this. You'll see the Shia Muslims in southern Lebanon, the Hezbollah people, dragging little kids and they're crying out in Arabic, La Amma, La Amma, La Amma, no mommy, no mommy. And the mullah with the beard is hacking their heads open with hatchets. That goes on now at the same geographical location. Savage, bloody barbarism. They gashed themselves and cut themselves. I will never forget this about 20 years ago. A hyper-charismatic Anglican church that was into the laughing, drunken, false revival, St. Andrew's Chorleywood. This was an upper-middle class, or is an upper-middle class suburb of London. These are upper-middle, educated, upper-middle class people, largely. The pastor previously, and was still there, was called David Pitches, an Anglican bishop. He wrote a book promoting the Kansas City prophets. Some said it thundered, is what he called the book. If you remember the Kansas City prophets, Paul Kane was found to be an alcoholic and a homosexual. Bob Jones, a womanizer, serial adulterer, etc. These were the Kansas City prophets who were promoted by Bishop David Pitchers at St. Andrew's Trolleywood. I will never forget it. He was standing there, and he had people into all kinds of uh, the, the, the gyrations and, and inebriated type behavior and crazy. crazy. There was one guy who was jumping up and down. And Pitcher says, well, watch this. He's pogo sticking. He's pogo sticking. And he was jumping up and down like a human pogo stick. And he comes up onto the platform. And David Pitcher asks him, how long has this been going on? And he says, since Tuesday. <laughs> and David Pitcher says, well, what do you do when you have to go to work? He says, nothing. I work for the church. There was a woman standing next to him going like this, like a bird, imitating a bird. And there was another woman with cracked glasses, cracked lenses in her glasses. She had the frames on, but it was cracked, and her eye was all swollen. She needed medical attention. She needed to go to an ophthalmologist to see if there was any glass particles in her eye, and she was standing there with a swollen eye and the cracked lens and the broken glass, and she's standing there laughing, giggling. And he asked her, what happened? And she said, somebody got slain in the spirit and fell on me. And they believe that's the Holy Spirit. St. Andrew's Trolley Wood, Church of England, charismatic. What were they trying to do? They're doing the same things as the priests of Baal, weren't they? They were doing the same things as the priests of Baal, trying to make the Holy Spirit fall, trying to induce their God to act. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. Not the lack of it. Let's look. It goes on. Verse 29, when midday was past, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. This goes on all day into the night now. From the morning, through noon, through afternoon, into the evening. And they raved on and on and on until it was time for the evening sacrifice at sunset. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Has any revival come to England since that nonsense promoted by those people, the priests of Baal? such as David Pitches and Colin Dye and Wynne Lewis, 
and Gerald Coates, these are the priests of Baal. Did any revival come? From Terry Virgo and these other priests of Baal? No revival came. John Arnott, no revival came. Mike Bickle, no revival came. And it's not coming with Bill Johnson either. These are the priests of Baal. You must understand, this is what we are up against. We are up against the priests of Baal. Oh, they claim it's Yahweh, but it's not. It goes on. Now, again, notice it's Jezebel. She's driving this thing. As we warned about two weeks ago, there's a reason you see so many of the deceivers Satan is using the most have become women. Joyce Meyer and Beth Moore and Cindy Jacobs, Paula White, one after the other. There's a reason. That's the Jezebel, dead men laws in Scotland. It's the Jezebel spirit. Well, let's look. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him after a whole day of this nonsense. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. The altar of the Lord had been torn down. The altar is where sacrifice for sin was made. And it had been torn down. Same today. Where was sacrifice for sin made? On the cross. The Old Testament altar is a type, a shadow of the cross of Jesus, isn't it? It's where the atonement for sin, the sacrifice was made, the blood sacrifice. But it was torn down. The altar has been torn down. The cross has been discarded. Instead of pick up your cross and follow me, it's you're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. Instead of the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, or you can be a Catholic and believe you're going to atone for your own in purgatory, you're a Christian. We have a crossless Christianity. God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for you. Just put your hand up and accept Jesus into your heart. He loves you so much. Yes, sister, I see. Yes, brother, God bless you. But where's the preaching of the cross? That he was nailed to that cross in my place and in your place to pay for what we did. And he tells us to pick it up and follow him. Well, that's not seeker sensitive. That's not seeker friendly. We prefer the purpose-driven lie. Yeah. Unless there is a return to the preaching of the cross, revival is certainly impossible. But the survival of the church is impossible. Paul boasted in nothing but the cross. Unless there is a return to the preaching of the cross, forget everything else. It's not going to happen. Story continues. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. This goes back, of course, to Genesis 49 and looks forward to the apostles, etc., to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill four pitchers of water 
and pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. Water was a very scarce and valuable commodity under the circumstances. They would have had to go and basically try to extract it from the shallow mud of the brook of Kishon at the foot of the mountain on the west. You can still see where it was. Let's continue. So go get it. He does it. Then Stonesy built the altar and made a trench around it. He arranged the wood, cut the ox in pieces, filled the four pitchers of water and said, do it a second time. Do it a third time. Three fours are how much? Twelve. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. The odds are really stacked against him now. To human understanding. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Notice it's Israel, not Jacob. After Jacob wrestled with the Metatron at the book of Peniel, his name was changed. He got a new name to Israel. We get a new name after we wrestle with the Lord. And the Lord prevailed. He gets a new name. I refer you to an older teaching we have on the internet that is entitled The Legacy of Jacob. But let's look. The time came, Elijah the prophet came near. Today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant. And I've done all these things at your word. Many sincere Christians with sincere intention do things at their own word according to their own understanding. Unless there is a clear leading of the Lord, there will not be an empowerment from the Lord. I've seen people try to bind Satan and cast out diseases. Can those things happen? Yes. But not arbitrarily. The Lord must be empowering and commissioning it in those circumstances. We always point to Luke 5. The power of the dunamis was present for him to perform healing. You can pray for the sick, but you can't command the disease to disappear arbitrarily. We can only do these things at the command of the Lord, at your word. Now, if something is in Scripture and we're commanded to do it, that's at his word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this day people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Only God can turn the heart of a backslider back. We can talk to them. We can try to get them back, as it says in James, and we should. We can certainly pray for them. But the same as only the Lord can save somebody, only the Lord can get a backslider to repent. Now, notice his motive. It was not, so they'll know that you sent me and that I'm your true prophet, not these false ones. That was not his primary motive. His motive was so that they will know you are the true Lord God. When the Lord empowers us supernaturally, the motive has to be right.
Now, there can be an instance, such as when Caiaphas prophesied rightly, even though he was conspiring to kill Jesus, because the Lord honored his place or position. But I mean for a faithful believer, for a faithful believer to be empowered to do something supernaturally, our motive has to be right. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Our God is a consuming fire. When all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal and do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Take them out and kill them. Of course, we do not slay them with the sword in the New Covenant. We use the sword of the Spirit. Bill Johnson is to be slain with the sword of the Spirit. Rick Warren is to be slain with the sword of the Spirit. These false teachers and false prophets are to be slain with the sword of the Spirit. Take them out and kill them. Not in a literal biological sense. God will take care of that if they don't repent. But destroy their ministries, destroy what they are. Take them out and kill them. Now notice that's after the Lord acts. We can't do it in our own strength. Neither can we do it in our own righteousness. But it continues. Now Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. For there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. But Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. This would suggest the conflict took place on the western slope, not the summit, but the western slope, close to the brook of Kishon. But then he ascends to the summit above it. Now, there's only a few places on the outskirts of the modern city of Haifa where this could have taken place, where you can see within eyesight, eyes vision, both the Brook of Kishon and the Mediterranean. So we pretty well know just about where this is or where this took place. He goes up there. Look towards the sea. He puts his face between his knees. He's down praying. Looked towards the sea. He went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go back seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up out of the sea. Notice at first nothing happens. He prays in earnest. His own faith is being challenged. What's happening? I said there's going to be rain. Lord, did I really hear from you? Was that really a prophetic revelation you gave me by your spirit? Where, where? And he prays. Kneels down, prays. Gets up, looks. Nothing. Comes back, prays some more. Gets up, looks, nothing. Comes back, kneels down, prays some more. This goes on seven times. Seven. 
number of completion. But then the seventh time, a cloud as small as the hand of a man coming from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you from going down from the Carmel. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Now remember our first Bible study on Elijah the week before last. We talked about how the rain from Isaiah 44, 3 is a picture of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Also, it says rain and the wind. In Hebrew, ruach. Wind as in breeze, ruach. The Holy Spirit in Hebrew, haruach hakodesh. Haruach hakodesh. Literally, the wind, the spirit of holiness. It begins small. A small hand comes out of the sea. Now, I don't want to go too far into the typology because I don't want to get speculative, but the Mediterranean as the sea is often a figure of, you know, the nations, the nations of the known world at that time. The hand of God comes up. It's the hand of God that comes up and makes it rain. It can only rain by God's hand, not man's. Native American Indians in their pre-Columbian shamanism with the medicine men had rain dances. <laughs> they thought they could make it rain by doing these dances of worship to their spirit being, great spirit. And they would do these dances and they had war dances, and, but they had rain dances. You had people trying to engineer revivals by every means imaginable. The whole Peter Wagner church growth model. The Toronto Pensacola laughing drunken model. That you can conjure it. That you can make it happen by hyping people up. Rain can only come by the hand of God. It can never come by the hand of man. Now remember, despite the lies we were taught by the leaders of the Elam movement in Britain or by John Arnott and these people in Canada and Michael Brown in the United States, despite those lies, every revival has always begun with people weeping. None has ever begun with people laughing. There are principles for revival, but there's no formula. The first principle is always repentance and prayer. Second, you must confront false religion those who are misleading the people. The people will not go in the way of truth unless those who are bringing them into the way of error are confronted and defeated. The priests of Baal must die. These denominations with their clergy who are seeing declining numbers with the COVID, they must die. Third, the altar of the Lord must be restored. The preaching of the cross, the true gospel. 
then and only then can it rain. Then and only then will the hand of God act. May not seem as much at first, just a little hand coming out of the sea. But that hand is the hand of the Almighty. And rain it will. And his spirit shall blow throughout the land. Now, of course, the last revival in Scripture is largely focused on God pouring out his spirit on Israel and the Jews. I mention that only in passing. For those who are always going on about a great end times revival, well, most of what the scripture says about anything like that concerns unbelieving Israel coming to believe. For the rest, the scripture speaks far more about a great time, great end time falling away than it does a great end time revival. Well, let's look. Hey, head goes. But Elijah overruns him. Ahab tells Jezebel all Elijah did. And then Jezebel goes on a rampage. We will resume there next week. This is the way it was. This is the way it's going to be. Now, this greatly concerns the specific prophetic material for Israel and the Jews. That's why you see the mention of Jacob. Well, Israel can have a broader meaning. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's faithful, the faithful Hebrews into which the believing Gentiles are grafted in. Israel. The Israel of God are the faithful Jews who believe in Jesus into which non-believing Jews are engrafted. The name of Jacob makes the text Judeo-centric. We have to bear in mind this has a special meaning in the last days for Israel and the Jews. Although James tells us it has application for the church. We gotta understand something. The faithful church is gonna be small groups. Don't think of churches bigger than 50. If they're bigger than 50, they probably sold out. The mega churches have had their day. These people who wanted to build mega churches were building monuments to themselves in many cases. They were building the empires of men, not the kingdom of God. The faithful church in the end will be smaller groups. Smaller. There will be people who will be taking risks for the sake of the Lord, for his people, and for the truth, like Obadiah. There will be people in professions like law and medicine, and certainly the judiciary and government, They'll be in a very precarious position. The corporate world. They'll be in a very precarious position. Already is this Lincoln Project in America that are trying to get lawyers disbarred for defending Donald Trump. How long do you think it's going to be before they try to get lawyers disbarred for defending pro-life advocates <laughs> or same-sex marriage opponents? We're going to have Christians in some very precarious situations. And there will be a drought. That drought is going to cause a famine for the hearing of the word of God. False religion will predominate. Look at the big churches. It's Stephen Furtick. It's Hillsong. Despite the sex scandals, People still go to Hillsong and Stephen Furtick and Andy Stanley. And these, <clears throat> these freak shows. Yeah, they're there. No revival's coming from them. They prevent revival, but they're there. But the faithful church will not be that. Only churches who sell out will be that. 
what happens? The drought and the famine. Small groups, groups of 50s, Obadiahs, people sticking their necks out, but in a very precarious position. Then, the conflict. There must be a conflict with the priests of Baal, with the leaders of the false church, with those who eat at Jezebel's table, etc., who tolerate the woman Jezebel. And it's not just Rome by any means. That conflict must take place. There must be a return to the cross and a radical return to the preaching of the cross. Without that, nothing's going to happen. Now we are guaranteed prophetically, we are guaranteed something is going to happen with Israel. God guarantees he's going to turn his grace back to the Jews. He guarantees that. Same as he guaranteed he was going to turn his grace away from them, and they've had 1,900 years of very ugly history ever since. He also guarantees he's going to turn his grace back towards them. They have a guarantee, not individually by any means, but as a nation and a people, he gave them a guarantee for the sake of their fathers. We see Zechariah 12 has to happen. They have a guarantee that he's going to pour his spirit on them. Howbeit under very, very desperate circumstances. But what about the church, the predominantly Gentile church? It has no guarantee. As such, people have tried to say it does by distorting the scriptures, the restoration movement, and so forth. It is no guarantee. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. One thing is for sure. If it does happen, it's going to happen the way it happened in 1 Kings 18. Or it is not going to happen at all. Lord willing, we'll catch you next week. God bless. Thank you for listening. We'll take a few questions, but they must, they must be related to tonight's subject only. Okay? We can't digress. Thank you. Questions? Jacob, thank you. A lot of detail, a lot of stuff to unpack there, as usual. And probably some people won't get their questions answered tonight. So I just remind you that if you want to discuss this amongst others in fellowship, go to the RTN online Bible study page on Facebook. Join the group. You'll be with like-minded people who aren't finding the answers from their pastors, unfortunately, at the local churches, if the local church still exists, but they're able to come together and to actually have a little bit of safety and a little bit of fellowship together as well. So I encourage you to have a look at that on Facebook. That's the RTN online Bible study related specifically to the Bible study here on a Wednesday night on RTN. Jacob, we look at a lot of the scriptures here that you've been reading tonight, and we see a lot of gematria, we see a lot of symbology, typology, and a lot of it washes over people's heads. Not, um, not gematria. We try and no, analyze this. Or there, was, well, there was no gematria tonight. There was no gematria. In general, we're talking about 12 and the 7s, okay. and those figures. So, symbolic numbers, okay. Okay, so one way that kind of says, a lot of things in the Bible, when we look at them, sometimes they wash over our heads. And unless somebody else unpacks it for us, we don't try and analyze it ourselves. But when we look at Proverbs, in so many places in Proverbs, it tells us to get wisdom. And in Proverbs 4, it tells us that wisdom is God's wisdom. In other words, it's his word himself. And James says... Ask for it, and you will richly receive. The Lord is not going to neglect you. How important is it, particularly at this time in the world history, for us actually to delve into the Scriptures at a deeper level to really understand the Scriptures and the examples given by Elijah and many of the Old Testament patriarchs? Because there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing that's going to surprise God or even us. It's already been laid out, hasn't it? Yes. 
Well, concerning delving into the scriptures, it's going to be the barometer of faithfulness. Daniel 12 tells us when yeah. these things happen, none of the wicked will understand. None of the wicked. And that doesn't just mean the world or the unsaved. It means the apostate church. None of the wicked will understand. Just like the days of Noah. Remember what Jesus said? They didn't understand until yeah. the flood took them away. They're not going to understand until it's too late. Now, concerning wisdom, well, Revelation 11, I'm sorry, Revelation 13, let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. Those who don't have mm. wisdom are not going to be able to properly identify the Antichrist and false prophet. But that's the answer to the question. I wonder if I no, could, no, I wonder if I could uh, interject here um, with a, a question, Jacob. It's in in my experience when being brought up in a, a brethren type church uh, in the UK, I increasingly came across leaders and elders who don't know the basics. They really don't know the basics. And what I mean, you know, you talk about wisdom, but they don't understand what Catholicism is, what they actually believe. Uh, so therefore, they're led astray themselves. So when you mentioned tonight about the charismatic Catholics, um, they actually think these guys are kosher. And it's a massive problem if the elders and leaders of our churches don't understand what other people believe, they don't have discernment, they don't have wisdom, and they lead the flock astray. By That's saying correct. by saying that these Catholics are, are fine, they're kosher and what correct. they believe and everything else. So so how how can there be a revival when the leaders of our churches don't even understand the basic fundamentals? I mean, sure you, you know, and if they're not if they're not delving into the scriptures, they're not going to know what they should be they don't know what they believe. I think that's what I'm trying to say. They don't actually know what they should believe. And that's the brethren. The brethren at one time had a strong scriptural emphasis. They they had a strong background in scripture. They was they were grounded in it. Most of them have lost that. In fact, nearly all of them have lost it. I but it's not just them. I remember a dear lady, she was a nice lady in Manchester, England, and I liked her, older lady. And she had a bookshelf filled with the books of the late Kenneth Hagin, the money preacher. She thought he was wonderful. And I told her, this is the false teachers, false prophets, Jesus warned would come in the last days to deceive the elect. And she said, what's wrong with it? She had no idea, you know, what, what this guy believed, that, that Satan got the victory on the cross and things like She had no idea. So I said, take any book off the bookshelf at random, any book. And she took one off. And I said, open to any page. And she opened to a page. And there was a sub-chapter heading, and it said, in bold print, faith sees the answer. Faith sees the answer. Now, he says faith sees the answer. Well, sometimes it may, but faith sees the answer? The scriptures say we walk by faith, not by sight. Which book do you believe, this one or the New Testament? The dear lady had no clue, no idea. The pastor never taught her. He didn't have any clue. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Mm. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the problem. Jacob, you know, I've even, I've even got into leaders' homes and seen the wife reading Joyce Myers and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And you sit down and explain, you know, that Joyce Myers is really theologically off the wall, that Christ died on the cross and went down into hell and was born yeah, again. All that all utter rubbish. And when I pointed it out to them, they were shocked to the core. They don't actually go and look at the polluted source that they're reading from or they're listening to. They don't even go and check it out. Yep. It's, it, what hope have we got if that's our leaders? That, that's the leaders. Yeah. That's correct. Do you have any questions, please, from the people who listened? Yes, the first question tonight, Jacob, we're going to hand over to Eric. Eric Fernandez, good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Amos. Thank you, Jacob, for the teaching tonight. Um, I just I had a quick question about uh, what you said about the end time revival being 
predominantly for for Israel. Um, we know that a, a, a major percentage of the church is backslidden, but I, I read in uh, in Amos chapter four verses uh, seven through eight when Amos is talking to Israel, which is backslidden in the northern kingdom, and he tells them about how God withheld rain from yeah. from them. He made it rain on one city and then withheld rain from another city. And one we part was that last week. Yeah. Is is that something that the church is, is, is that a shadow of type? Is that a shadow and a type of what the church, the last day's church, what we're looking at in front it's of us the now? The general truth, where the Holy Spirit's outpoured, there's going to be a move of God. When the Holy Spirit's not being outpoured, it's not going to be. But the Lord withholds the rain in judgment. Now, there is a general yeah. truth that applies to the church, but it applies at any time in history, not just the last days. It's just that it has a specific focus for the last days. And it can apply to anywhere in the world. It's just that it has a specific application to Israel. Okay? Yes. yes. Okay. okay. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. We go to Liz Payne. Liz Payne, you've got a question tonight. I believe it's your first time here. Yeah. Um, hello, um, Jacob. Um, I just no. wanted to ask you um, about um, Catholicism and how you um, how you would witness to someone who's really into that in these last days. Where are you? You're in East London. No, I'm in La I'm in South London. South London, Bermondsey. Yeah, Bermondsey girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get it from your accent when you are in London. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been trying to tell him. Um, okay, first of all, the age of the person is important. 70 now. He's, he's yeah, about he's, the. Oh, he's just yeah. awful. He was in, into it as a kid and brought up. Yeah. Is yeah. He, secondly, is he from an Irish background? Mm, possibly, possibly, we okay. could be. It's a family member as well. It was my yeah. mum's cousin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, what I would do is say, you know, I love Catholic people. I have Catholic friends and family and things like that. Yeah. But I, I, I love Jesus and I read the scriptures, and I have a problem. What, for instance? Now, the scripture says, and I'd show them, forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. It comes from the devil. The Catholic Church admits that St. Peter and the apostles were mostly married. St. Peter was married. His wife's name was Deborah, and, and, and these kind of things. And it's a doctrine of devils to forbid yeah. marriage. Now, God made them male and female and said it was good, but the Catholic Church had a different view and you see all this pedophilia molesting it's all over the world thousands and thousands and thousands of cases and the bishops and popes are being caught well if the bible says this is doctrine of devils and you see what happens as a result i just i just don't understand how i can believe that when the, when jesus said not to yeah, yeah. Or I, would, I would say now look you know in matthew 23 Jesus said, as a religious title, call no man your father. One is your father in heaven. Mm. To call a priest your father or the pope your father when Jesus said, don't do it. Yeah. How do I, you know, I can't reckon. I believe in Jesus. I'm not against Catholics. I just don't see how I can agree. Now, this is going to cause something in him known as cognitive dissonance. He's going. He's getting, to, he gets angry. He gets. He yes, goes. He right. goes. Liz, we're going to fall out about this. He gets really angry. <laughs> when people run from the truth, mm. they're running from God. Yeah. All you, can, all you can do is pray for them if they're not open. If somebody's not open to honest dialogue, all you can do is pray for them. Yeah. Okay. If they're gonna, yeah. okay. All if they're not open to honest dialogue, all you can do is pray that God will open them to it. Yeah. But because my mum, my mum died a Catholic. She uh, won't. Thanks, and bloody blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, Jacob. Um, I just want to okay. thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, brother. No, no good okay. question, Liz. Liz, if, if it helps, and anybody who's involved or has got friends or family 
in other religions, whether it be Mormonism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Islam or whatever, if you yeah. go to the Moriel website, that's moriel.org, Jacob has defined or refined it into five simple questions to ask people who were trying to challenge the realistic evangelical perspective on what the Lord has said. So if you go to moriel.org, click on the five relevant questions, whether it's Islam, whether it's Catholicism, whatever, those questions will put you in a good stead to actually to rebut some of the arguments that people are putting forward. But the reality is, as you've mentioned yourself tonight, uh, Liz, it's mostly yeah. cultural. It's historical. It's like politics. Yeah. My father was labor, and my father before him was labor, and I'm labor. Yeah. <laughs> people don't think outside the box. And that's why yeah. I was saying earlier tonight, we need to get wisdom, but that wisdom is the Lord himself. Get what his word says. What those Forget questions what do, Liz, yeah. is it says questions for our Catholic friends. Yeah. Okay. It, it, okay. Instead yeah. of telling them what's wrong, you ask them the question and let them defend it you know what i'm saying yeah i i said things to him like you but you're praying to mary in sacraments and he goes yes i do pray to mary he gets really angry see what the what the, the, the series that amos just mentioned does it asks them questions and lets them try to answer it okay and they can't really answer in an honest manner they, yeah they'll be confused about it okay, okay. Okay, I'll, give, question, I'll, I'll read that. Thank you, guys. Bless you. God bless ja you, Jacob. Friends. Jacob, am I, am I right in thinking, for, for Liz's benefit, that generally Catholics aren't encouraged to read the Bible themselves? Never have been. No. That's another problem. Yeah, he he just he thinks that's written by man and stuff. It's yep. really odd. So I can't even yeah, point there's into a whole range of issues, and if you even look at Catholic documentation and Catholic public publications. The majority of the Catholic Church couldn't access a Bible printed in English until 1948, after the Second World War. That's, right. that's when the first one was generally at large. So that tells you uh, something. Steve Valor or Rose McDonough, thank if you, you. Can ask a question. Oh, your microphone unmuted. That's Steve or Rosemary Valor. Had you a question? No. Okay. We go to Helen. Helen, good evening. Hi. Thanks, Amos. Hi, Jacob. Um, Hello. It's just the um, part of scripture know. where, it, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, where please. Elijah, where he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. I'm just curious, is there any sort of symbolic reason why he prayed in that position? Yeah. The Hebrew word again is hishtak vayar, to bow down. They were doing that to Baal and to Ashtaroth. He was doing it to Yahweh. Right. Okay. Bowing down or genuflecting any of that is an act of worship. Okay. He just didn't, the, the description to me didn't seem like he was bowing down. He sort of, I don't know, you know, when you're feeling faint, so well, sit, he sit, sit down and put your between, head between your knees. <laughs> he bowed his head between his knees. That would seem to, as a gesture, indicate, I wouldn't say desperation, but serious earnest. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's submission, isn't it? It's total submission. Yeah. There's another mm -hmm. aspect. If Again, this is not theological. It's just what's known about body language. Um, again, I'm not making this as a doctrinal statement. When you get into a position like that, you are attempting to enter the realm of God not and, and, and isolate yourself from the temporal realm. You understand? He wanted to be hyper-focused yeah. on the Lord, not his surroundings. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I suppose it's similar, Jacob, whenever we close our eyes to pray, we don't want any other That's distractions right. or anything else that's going to interfere with focusing on the Lord. That's I suppose right. it's very similar to that. Louise Goodreads, good evening. You've got a question. Louise, Louise Goodreads. Yes, yes, thank you. Hi, Louise. Um, I've been out of the Catholic Church for many years. Uh, Thank my God family, for that. Yes. <laughs> um, my dad went into the ministry after we came out of the Catholic Church. Where, where are you based, Louise? Pardon me? You're Canadian? Where are you? No, I'm in Maine, in the You're United in States, New England. Acadia, Maine, like that way? Uh, uh, Bangor? Uh, it's north of Portland. 
just a little ways north of Portland. What's the temperature, Fahrenheit or Celsius? What's oh, it's about 25 degrees right now. That's it's very bad. cold. That's not bad for you guys. It's been very cold. It was below zero this morning. Oh, oh, was it? Okay. Yes. What's your question, please? Okay, I'll try to be. I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, my sister uh, claims to be a Christian. I believe that she loves the Lord. She says she reads her Bible. She's very devout. Goes to church. I mean, when she can go to church, she goes. Um, her problem is transubstantiation, and I've tried to point out to her that the Book of Hebrews speaks against that. Yeah. It says, it was one sacrifice for all time, etc. And she became very angry and said, that's where we part company. So I just dropped it. And uh, I pray every day that the Lord will give her understanding and wisdom. My question really is, should I keep attempting to go in that area? Or should I just back away and leave her alone and keep praying? As the Lord leads you, but there's better ammunition then you're, then you're presently firing. If you could get her to read what Jesus actually said in John 6, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, in John 6, Jesus states three times that it's about belief. The believing has eternal life if you believe it. He says this three times in John 6, okay? Yes. The theme, repeated theme, is belief. Now, let's go to where he says, uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, okay? Mm -hmm. In verse 41, I am the bread that came down from heaven. What Jesus is doing is showing himself as the antitype, that is the fulfillment of the manna that fell with Moses, okay? Mm -hmm. In verse 49, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and died. This is the manna which comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh, okay? Then he goes on. He says that Moses gave them bread in the wilderness, but it perished. The bread that Moses gave in the wilderness perished. Let's go back to verse 26. Sorry. Truly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and fishes. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. Okay. So the food he's going to give is not going to perish, okay? So therefore, he must be talking on a spiritual level, not a literal one, not a physical one. Because if a Roman Catholic eats and drinks the Eucharist, I assure you that their Jesus is going to wind up in the sewage system. Now let's look at verse 53, please. So Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I'll raise him up on the last day, okay? But my flesh is true food. In other words, it won't perish. And my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Okay, as the Father sent me and so forth. Verse 58, this is the bread which comes down out of heaven. Now, continue reading. And he goes on and he says only a few verses later that in verse 63, it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing in the context it's impossible that the physical eating of something that will metabolically organically perish can be what he's talking about mm -hmm. it's the spirit that giveth life it's a food that will not perish it is not organic 
food. That word in Greek would be broma. It's not that word. Well, it's, it's something spiritual. He's talking about in contrast to broma. Okay. So if the flesh profits nothing, how can eternal life come from eating his flesh? So what is this? You have to read it in the context of the gospel. John 1, verse 14. The Logos became Sarx. The Word became flesh. Okay? You see what I'm saying? The Word became flesh. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 2. So chapter 3, verse 1. Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll. You see he eats the word? Turn with me to Jeremiah, please. Chapter... Uh, Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 15. Verse 16 of Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found, and I ate them. Look to the book of Revelation, chapter 10, please. Revelation, chapter 10, verse 9. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, take it and eat it. Verse 10, I took the book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. The word became flesh in both testaments. In the mentality of the Jews, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and in the New Testament, eating the word is believing it. You eat the word. The word became flesh. The flesh profits nothing. It cannot be the literal trans allegedly transubstantiated food itself. Always remember Acts 15. If that's his blood, why are you drinking it? The apostle said, don't do it. Okay. Now, it even goes beyond this. I won't bore you with all of Aristotle's philosophy of accidents, but the Lord's Supper, what Catholics call communion, call communion, was instituted at a Jewish Paschal Seder. Okay? The Paschal Seder must be celebrated on Seder night in Jerusalem. It must be celebrated the Ed of Hog on the 14th of Nisan in August, uh, April, roughly. And it's a pilgrim feast. It had to be celebrated in Jerusalem. John 6 is in Galilee. Wrong time, wrong place. It is not primarily talking about the Passover. It was not Passover time. The Lord's Supper comes from Passover. This was in Galilee at Capernaum, Capernaum, and it was not Passover. So they're taking it out of what's known as the Sitzemleben, the historical cultural context of, of the Jews of which Jesus is one. It, it was not primarily talking about that. It's talking about Jesus as the antitype of the manna that fell in the wilderness. And it alludes back to Melchizedek. Remember, Melchizedek came with the bread and the wine with Abraham? It, it's that. It's not talking about the Passover, the Lord's Supper. We're told in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ our Passover. 
So it's the wrong time, the wrong place. It's not primarily talking about the Lord's Supper because it's not Paschal. Secondly, the word became flesh. Eating the word is believing the word. Same as what you eat, you are metabolically. What you eat, you are. The doctrine you believe is what you are spiritually. Okay, if you believe in idolatry of transubstantiation, you're going to be an idolater. Okay, you're going to be a cannibal. <laughs> That's what you believe. Okay, the flesh profits nothing. Now, if you can get her to dialogue with you about that, you might get somewhere, but only with prayer. Does that help? I can't hear you. Please unmute. Yes, Jacob, thank you. It did help me a lot. Um, okay. She's very, very set, very set in her ways, but I'll, I'll pray on it. <laughs> the Lord can change people's hearts and minds. Yes. Well, well, perseverance and patience, thank Louise, but thank you. It's a great question. Leanne, you have a question this evening. Good evening. No question. It, I just was uh, giving people an idea of the Jesus died spiritually doctrine that had been mentioned, Jesus oh, okay. dying on the cross well, and I going see. to hell. I came okay, out of word you. of faith, so I know that this is being now retaught by Bill Johnson. It's being propagated again, so yeah. everyone be aware of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Deborah Garner, good evening in uh, New Jersey or New York, I think you are. <laughs> I'm in Connecticut. Well, not far away. Are you in Stamford, <laughs> Connecticut? Uh, not down that far. I'm in the middle of the state, southern town. Hartford? New Haven? 20, 20, close, to, close to New Haven. Close to New Haven. Close to New Haven. Close to Yale. I was just talking to my friend in Old Greenwich the other night. Oh, okay. Well, I'm asking for prayer. Um, I, I'm a little discouraged, and maybe I'm not as hopeful as everyone else. I, I just wanted to mention Zechariah 7 and 11, but they refused to heed shrugged their shoulders and stopped their ears so they could not so they could not hear. You know, I wonder at this point, can we really reach people that don't want to hear? No. You know, if, if they've sat up under this type of teaching and apostasy 20, 30, 40 years, what can we say to them at Unless, this point? It's like an unsaved person. You can witness to them, but until they're convicted by the Holy Spirit and they hear the voice of the Lord, they're not going to get saved. When right. somebody goes far enough into error, even if they had a born-again experience at some point in their life, if someone becomes that ingrained in error, only the Lord can take the plugs out of their ears. Right. And the second part of my uh, question is, what will a confrontation with Baal's prophets look like? How does that happen? How are we going to engage these people? It will not be what Elijah did literally, but it will be those principles. Putting the going back to the cross, saying what, what you say about God proves that you're not worshiping the real God. It's not the right. real Jesus. You contend right. for the things he contended for. Right. Okay. Yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Deborah. Thank you. Jacob, how important is it to realize that whenever we do witness to somebody, that it's actually not us witnessing? It's the Holy Spirit working through us. And there yeah. will be a time, and the Bible actually tells us, when we start getting mocked to walk away. They must, they must hear the voice of Jesus or they're not going to get saved. We are and that's the bottom line. We are simply we yeah, we do hear too often of people, oh, I'm an evangelist and I go out and I win souls. And there is that ego trip side of it that people take on this, it's me. You know, I, I'm I'm able to heal people. or, And that's the problem, isn't it? It's that the spotlight's on me. And as you pointed out tonight, Elijah totally steered away from it. It wasn't him. It was the Lord. That's right. How important is it to recognize the difference? Look, there are people who Paul says preach the gospel from a wrong motive. There is power of the salvation in the word of God simply because it's God's word. It'll never be as powerful in the mouth of somebody who is not the Lord's anointed as it is in the mouth of somebody who the Lord did anoint. Remember, like uh, the, the Jewish priests 
well, and the demons told them, who is uh, Paul? We know Jesus. We know, but who are you? You know what I'm saying? Then, um, yeah. <clears throat> but people can hear the gospel and get saved through those who preach it with <coughs> a wrong motive. Because God is in the business of saving people. He'll use anything or anybody, practically, to see somebody get saved. But that does not bear witness at all to the evangelist. It only bears witness to Jesus. Now, there are yeah. faithful evangelists who turn many to righteousness, says in Daniel. But, you know, this, we always go back to Matthew 7, 22. Many will come in my name, but also many will say to me that day, Lord, did we not do this, that, and the other thing? Well, yeah, you did. Now get lost. I never knew you. Never knew you. Some of these people were never yeah. saved. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that. Jacob, we've heard tonight when we went through the lesson about the 450 prophets to Baal, and we think we had four questions from the generality of the, the studio audience tonight in relation to Catholicism, and they've attributed what they've seen about Baal as to similar of the Roman Catholic Church. How important an influence is Roman Catholic Church today, and how important will it be in end times eschatology. Okay, Mo morally, it has lost its credibility, except among older people. Even in once very Catholic countries like Latin America, the Philippines, and certainly in Ireland, it has lost its moral credibility with the young people. It is morally debased. It has no theological or spiritual credibility among most people, and particularly among most young people. That's gone. What it does instead is goes into a social gospel and a political gospel. Paul warns about false religions and what they do. They will become, like, for instance, to try to redeem itself in the United States because of all the pedophilia. They've tried to become spokesmen for illegal immigrants and things like that. They've tried to misrepresent themselves. As, as, as being crusaders for righteousness. In fact, church attendance or mass attendance in America has gone so low, they're trying to import Latin Americans to get people to go to mass again. That's what they're on about. What the Roman Catholic Church will always do, when they do something, there's usually a political or a financial motive on back of it. There's a political or a financial motive. The Roman Catholic Church is a political and financial interest operating under the masquerade of religion. But if you go back to the papal states, it has always been a political economic enterprise that uses religions for those ends. Now, it's lost moral credibility, but it never really had any. You can go back to the Middle Ages and see the Borgia popes and the Medici popes. They were immoral people with children born out of wedlock, everything. It was what the church was, and I use the church a very small c. It's what it was politically and financially that was the glue that held it together. Well, that's what it's going to be. It's going to use politics and, and public relations and things of that nature to make itself a viable commodity in the, in, in the religious sphere. But in terms of spiritual value or moral credibility, it's lost it. Yeah. That is one of the reasons they've gone into the interfaith movement, where they're trying to unite with other religions. They used to say it's the Catholic Church is the one true church. It's still their official doctrine, but they used to bang that drum. We're the one true church. Boom, boom, boom. Now they're getting into bed with people they used to hate. Why? Because they're declining. They're trying to, they're trying to save the ship that's sinking. And their, their means of doing it is false unity, ecumenism, interfaith, and then social gospel, and and politics. That's what they've done, and that's what they do. You know, I read recently, Jacob, that I think it was nine or ten USA bishops and archbishops who've come out to say homosexuality is now okay. It should be okay for everybody else. And they will change it for the sake of acceptability, and that's the reality. There's no consistency. The Pope is doing it. it. Yeah. The present Pope has virtually said the same thing. But, okay. 
Another question, please. We have time for one more question. Was there it's, nothing it's Helen again. Helen, good evening. Hi. Um, we just talked about the Roman Catholic Church. I came out of that, and um, praise God, my mum sort of followed me about six years after. Um, but, you know, you are just saying there that it's declining. I was watching something on YouTube the other day with Roger Oakland and Dave Hunt, etc., on the apparitions of Mary. Um and I'm, I'm well, a very massive experiential um, type thing where it did seem that there were, well, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people are following the the Mary thing. Is that still as big? Yeah, because they always get Fatima, Lords, Medjugorje, knock in Ireland. Remember yeah. in Jeremiah, they'll be sacrificing cakes to the Queen of Heaven? Queen of Heaven, yeah. I mean, I went to well, Lords, obviously. Yeah, yeah, Catholic. yeah well, they, mm. the, the Catholic Church has said that Mary is the key link between Roman Catholicism and Islam because one of the most common female names in Arabic is Fatma. Fatma. Um, right. and, and, and Mary features, again, they, they confuse with the sister of Moses in the Quran very much, but mm. also the Mother Earth, the whole female cult deities of, of uh, yeah. Sitra in, 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 in Hinduism. You know, when they celebrate Diwali and so forth, you see the female cult deities. Again, it's common ground with these other religions. Yeah, it's the female, female deities. Yeah. That is that is absolutely correct. So, yeah, yeah it's, I, I said some years ago that the cult of Mary is going to blossom across religious lines. Uh, and it's going to be something that is going to help set the stage for Antichrist. Remember the woman. It's false religion is always personified as a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, in Reve the, the Revelation seventeen and eighteen, the great harlot. You know, or the woman Jezebel, as Jesus said, you, you've got this female thing. You know, and and it's happening. And yeah. yes, the, now of course, this is not to confuse what they're doing with the real Miriam, the real Mary of Scripture. Their Mary is not the real one in Scripture. Um, one day up in heaven, uh, Jesus said to his father, stepfather, Joseph, Joseph, you were a great stepfather when I was on earth as a human, a human boy, and you were a great stepfather. And you, you listened to God, and I was saved from Herod, and you, you, were, you were really a great stepfather. You were a great dad. Couldn't have asked for a better one. If I gave you three weeks holiday, vacation, and sent you back to Earth, where would you like to go? Joseph says, well, I'd like to go on a tour of DIY hardware stores. And Jesus says, why do you want to do that for? He says, well, Black & Decker, power tools, drills, jigs, we didn't have power to electric saws. We didn't have these kind of things when I was in the trade. I'm curious about the new tools and new technology. I want to go down to earth and see power tools in hardware stores and DIY stores. Can, can you send me back? So oh, that's just what you want to do. And then he says to Miriam, Mary, you know, you were my earthly mother and you were a great mother and you stood with me to the end and yeah. Uh, I loved you so much, and I still love you. Tell me, if I gave you three weeks vacation back down on Earth, holiday, and you could go anywhere you want, where would you want to go? And she said, I'd like to go on a religious pilgrimage. And he said, to where? And she said, to Fatima, Lourdes, Madrigori, Guadalupe, and Nuck. What do you want to go there for? And she said, I never been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why well, it's true, Jake. It's went all the way back to semi. I think Rosemary had one say. question. Before we, go, before we yes, yeah, Before we go, we'll take one question from Rosemary, please. She had her hand up. Rosemary. Rosemary Gallo. Rosemary and Steve Valley, your mic keeps opening and closing. I don't know whether you want to ask a question, guys. No, I'll leave that. Thank you. Jacob, just one closing up. question. 
Is the hand still up, Stephen Rosemary? Oh, I'm so sorry we didn't get to them. No, okay, not to worry. Jacob, you mentioned, and I think it was very informative, and it's something which we haven't heard that often, but you used the example. Oh, they're they're back, they're back. Yeah. 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 There we are. Can you he lost it for a minute. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Steve. Uh, at some point at the end, there's got to, there's got to be a parallel between uh, the Lord's Supper and some unholy communion. Uh, just get this sense, because blood plays such an important part with all of this. Um, but it's difficult for, at the moment for me to, to grasp fully what's going to happen. But I just get the sense, especially with what you're talking about tonight, um, with the uh, false prophets cutting themselves. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, there's got to I just get this sense that this unholy communion has got something to do with the mark of the beast because there's no way back once you get in it. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit confused on this, but it, it, it's just some thoughts that have been running around in my mind. Uh, I don't know of any text that would associate transubstantiation or anything of that with the mark of the beast, except in the very broad sense that they're both false. Yeah, it, it's not so much the transubstantiation, but a, 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 an initializing of a new unholy supper. That's all. Uh huh. Well, I, there will be a, a holy supper, but an unholy one, that's always gone on. It's the Mass, you know. Yeah. Okay. The, Hindus, the Hindus with the Vishnu, they yeah. believe that the food is in, in, imbued with, the, with their idols. Yeah, this is why I was thinking that somehow it, it gets incorporated yeah. into whatever the Antichrist brings about. Yeah. yeah, eclecticism, religious eclecticism and syncretism will all be a major factor in building the false religious system for mm -hmm. the Antichrist. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. All right, David, 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 David Wanaki? Yes. Hi, uh, um, just to say, Yakov. Um, your, that, that video you did, uh, the Daniels Project, my brother was into the New Age, but when he saw that video, um, he came back to the Lord. That was over 10 years ago, but it was a fantastic. I actually watched it last night, and um, it, I thought it was brilliant, the way you, you describe the prophecies of Daniel and how it's been fulfilled in our day. Yeah. It's really well put together. When the COVID is over, Lord willing, we're going to make another one. That'll be oh, better. Praise God. Lord willing. Amen. But in fact, it would have been made already, except COVID struck, so. Oh, yeah. But okay, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you, David. everyone. Thank you. Just one thought to close. When we look at the examples you've given tonight of the small groups, going back to the way it was, so in the early days church, it was small groups. We've seen Paul going down by the river. He met up with Dorcas and a group of other women because there wasn't a quorum of men, and together they formed a little fellowship. You're saying 40 or 50 perhaps is, is a maximum. What do we then use as the role model for that system of church? Would Col uh, Colossians 3.16 be a good example? Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. They, they, they give themselves to teaching, to encouraging yeah, one well, another that, that, with wisdom. Well, and That would be... Everyone would well, have a psalm, etc. Acts chapter 2... That stuff would be for any church if it's 50 or 50,000. Those principles would be the same for any church at any time. Yeah. The principles. Thank you very much, Dick. That's what yeah. I was going to say. If people are, as we've seen tonight and over the last couple of weeks, a lot of people are in isolation, not just from COVID, but isolation from a lot of the churches they've been to for a long period of time, mm -hmm. the big denominations. People are now quite lonely and haven't had the chance of fellowship, but they're now starting to develop that relationship with a few others by this uh, medium here at RTN and getting together with some other people. But I'm just trying to give them a little bit of a steer as to what the template should be for the small high script for the actual group coming together as regards leadership, doctrine, and actual um, formula, if you want to, for, for the actual small high script and shirts. That's really what I was looking at. Okay, well, we should see you hopefully. Thank you, Jacob. I'm oh, sorry, uh, next uh, Friday. With Marco and myself, the catching up, the, the next catching up uh, webcast will be next Friday with Marco and myself, 9.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time.
Thank you, Jacob. Have we finished with Elijah now? Are we going to do something else? Oh, no, we'll go on. We'll, we'll go on. We're going to go on. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in tonight, for staying with us. For those of you who had to go to the live stream, who will normally join us on the Zoom, hopefully by next week, Charles will have resolved the email issue. We've had a big problem with the email. We didn't realize how how large it was. We thought it was just isolated in a few areas, but hopefully Charles will resolve that. Thank you very much for your time. Bless you all, wherever you may be. Please have a look at the group page on the RTN online Bible study on Facebook. Until next week, God bless. Take good care. Bringing light out of the darkness. RTN TV. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.